this speaker and her organization have helped make the color pink a fierce <laughs> color. So Medea Benjamin, code pink. Well, thank you, um, Jonathan, for so much wonderful work you have been doing and uh, all the people who helped to organize this. Uh, I am delighted that there are a number of students from different universities, and I want to focus my presentation on the fun things that you can do to try to stop war. And uh, so, Code Pink, um, I think it was Cole that mentioned in the earlier, uh, no, Joe Gerson, um, we participated in this wonderful movement of women crossing the, quote, demilitarized zone. And I say, quote, because it is not demilitarized. It is a very militarized zone. And um, this was organized by Korean Americans. And uh, Christine Ahn gathered 30 women from 15 different countries. And we started in North Korea and then marched over to the South. And I'm giving this as an example of what you can do to kind of model the uh, the people-to-people -people ties that you want your government to do. Uh, here we are, uh, a group of us, and uh, walking across the DMZ. We started actually in North Korea, where we did some really cool things like stitching together a um, banner that was a traditional Korean one that showed South and North coming together with the United States. We had really profound meetings with both older and younger uh, women from North Korea. We had some very sad encounters where the uh, older women told us about their uh, horrible experiences with the US Army during the Korean War. When we crossed over to the South Korean side, we had some amazing, huge rallies, although I must say we were protested by South Koreans who did not want to see uh, this kind of activity taking place. And so we had a cordon of police, like hundreds of police, uh, guarding us wherever we went. Uh, women call for a Korean peace treaty. And um, it was a really beautiful experience. We have also gone to Korea to support communities who are trying to stop the expansion of US bases in Korea. Uh, I recently was with another group that went to try to protest the um, uh, THAAD missile system, anti-missile system that uh, Lockheed Martin was putting in there. Uh, and then I want to jump over to Iran, where we have gone to meet with Iranian uh, both women's groups as well as others, these on the um, on the uh, right-hand side are Iranian members, uh, uh, Iranian members of parliament. Um, we also, uh, coming back to the U.S., have uh, not only participate in normal lobbying, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, get up inside these a lot of these congressional hearings uh, to be a voice of uh, what I would consider sanity among what Andrea calls the critters in Congress who oftentimes are so enamored of war. And um, we do have a number of young people who have joined us, and at first they say, well, you know, you all can do the 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 the, the uh, uh, banner holding in Congress because it does risk arrest. You don't always get arrested, but you never know if you will. Uh, but after going with us for a couple of times, the younger women are like, "Give me that banner!" <laughs> <laughs> and um, here they look kind of miserable. This is a sit-in at one of the congressional offices. I actually think it might be Elizabeth Warren's office. Um, but um, these things can be quite effective because especially among the more liberal members of Congress, you know, they don't want to be seen as being uh, warmongers. But sometimes we go after the real warmongers. Here is Ted Cruz, where we uh, followed him around because he was such a vociferous opponent of the Iran nuclear deal. We had a really uh, heartfelt uh, campaign in which we did a um, two-week fasting in congressional offices, where we'd go in the office and just sit there all day long without eating. And this one wonderful 
a woman who's at the front here, um, she is already quite skinny, and after two weeks, she was not feeling too well, and she fainted in the office of one of the senators, uh, which caused the ambulances to come in, and of course, that also caused the media to come in. So we got a lot of attention for this, and the senators then called us in for a meeting in which we could finally talk to them about why we decided to fast for two weeks uh, around this issue of Iran. When they do the right thing, we are there to thank them. Um, we were, uh, uh, went to John Kerry's house to thank him for the amazing work he did to negotiate the Iran nuclear deal. We went to the hearing where he was testifying. And you know, they really don't know what to do with us when we're there saying nice things. <laughs> we also went to the embassies of all the uh, the signatories of the Iran nuclear uh, the, the nuclear deal to thank them for uh, their hard work to come to a deal and to encourage them to stay in the deal, whether or not the U.S. did. Um, and I want to then move on to our newest campaign, which is around divesting from the war machine. And this is a campaign where we have encouraged about 70 other groups to sign on to work with us, uh, where we have um, a lot of wonderful validators like Bernie Sanders, who says how tragic it is that the United States, while hundreds of millions of people live in abysmal poverty, the arms merchants of the world grow increasingly rich as governments spend trillions of dollars on weapons of destruction. And we have another wonderful validator who is the Pope, who uh, has said, oh, I didn't get that out of here, sorry. Um, he said that, um, is this war or that war really a war to solve problems, or is it a commercial war for selling weapons in illegal trade so that the merchants of death can get rich. And of course we say it is the merchants of death that are getting rich. And this gives us an opening to go to a number of the uh, Catholic churches, the Catholic universities, and other Catholic institutions to say the Pope said that we can't remain silent while the merchants of death are profiting from war. Um, we also have gone to city councils and gotten them to not just pass resolutions, but to investigate where their city money is being invested and to take money out of uh, the companies that profit from war. And we are doing now that with universities, where we start out with educational uh, teach-ins, film screenings, and then move on to look at the divestment campaigns, profiting quite a lot from the ones who have come before us, who have divested uh, from the fossil fuel companies. And we are encouraging students to look at a combined divestment, that is fossil fuels, the weapons industry, private prisons, uh, and um, make that kind of a, a combination. And in fact, the issue of the, um, the war at home and the war abroad is something that has resonated with a lot of students. When you look at the Pentagon programs like dumping their, quote, surplus weapons into our cities or the way the local police have become so militarized, um, we try to connect these issues. We've also used the great enthusiasm that has come out of the, um, the students from Parkland who have not only called for uh, some real legislation around gun violence, but they've also made the connection around the NRA and the lobby and how corrupt the system is and going after the Congress people who continue to take money from the NRA. And so we have combined a pledge to not take any NRA money with a pledge not to take money from the weapons companies. And that has been extremely successful just in the short time, which is the last month that we've been doing this. Uh, Jan Tchaikovsky, for example, is somebody who was very supportive of the students and doesn't take NRA money, but lo and behold, she was taking quite a lot of money from the weapons industry. And when we made that connection, she said, oh, yes, of course I too should make that connection and sign the pledge not to take money from the weapons industries. Same thing from others like Maxine Waters, um, like Yvette Clark, 
uh, Keith Ellison, who is the head of the Progressive Caucus. Well, uh, he was, and now he's in, the, in an even more important position, too, in, in terms of the Democratic Party itself. Uh, and he was taking uh, money from the weapons industry. You know, for a lot of these progressive people, they don't even pay attention to it very much uh, because, uh, in many cases, they don't solicit from the weapons company. It just comes in. And uh, they oftentimes don't pay attention. In fact, uh, Jamie Raskin, one of the most progressive members we have in Congress from Maryland, uh, he said he took was getting checks from Raytheon that he never solicited, and he didn't even bother to send back because nobody bothered to ask him to send them back. And now that we have, he has to rethink his policy about taking money from the weapons industry. It's not always easy. I must say that somebody like Jim McGovern, that you think would be a cinch just to get him to say, I will not take it. We have had a lot of back and forth with, uh, with his office, and he still hasn't agreed to make that commitment. Um, uh, another issue that came up after the Parkland shooting was the issue of the fact that there are these, um, uh, uh, the junior uh, uh, officer training corps, the what's called J. Rotsi, in the schools and the high schools for the young people here. Do you remember in your school? Raise your hand if there was a J. Rotsi. Yes. Yeah. So it's in quite a number of schools, and then some of those schools. 2,000 schools, and then some of those schools actually have shooting ranges in the school. Yours did? Yeah. Uh, and um, Nicholas Cruz, the shooter in, in Parkland, was taught to shoot a gun in the ninth grade in his J. Rotsi course, and he was actually wearing even his J. Rotsi shirt when he did the shooting. Um, we put out a call uh, to get rid of J. Rotsi, and it got onto Fox News, and boy, the hate mail that we've been getting ever since then has been quite remarkable. But it's a good campaign that we look forward to doing more on. Um, we also realized that while these big weapons companies like Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin are so huge, how do you get at them? You go to some of their big investors, and one of their biggest investors is the huge financial institution called BlackRock. We just started a campaign against BlackRock two weeks ago, and already with a small group of people protesting at a couple of their offices, we have just driven them crazy. Some of you um, were, yes, <laughs> you know. This is Natasha, a student organizer that just started working with Code Pink. She was the lone protester in Houston at their headquarters. We were supposed to have a talk with them, and they said, we can't talk to you right now because there's so many security issues that you have caused for our company. Look at Houston. We had a big security issue. There was one woman. This is her outside. <laughs> We have shut down their entire buildings for the time that one or two people have been standing outside there. So they are very much freaked out, and they will only talk to us now when things calm down. Um, so we um, do try to have a good time while we are affecting these uh, big, big, serious issues. And the last thing I wanted to say is that we have internships in Washington, DC, in Los Angeles, and in our offices in San Francisco. We also have a Code Pink activist house that you are also invited to. Come take your vacation week there, or if you're retired, or if you're a student, come for a week time. Uh, we'll show you a good time in Washington. In DC and um, uh, what? <laughs> it is uh, right in Brookland, uh, which is near Catholic University. It's just a, a hop and a skip from uh, both the White House and the Congress. And we encourage you to come join us uh, or participate with some of our local groups. And thank you all for all the incredible work that so many of you in this room are doing that is very inspiring. Thank you.